Right in the middle here. Right here, please. And, and then just here, please, in the middle. And the right. second row would be nice, too. This on the right. And another to the right one, right. On the right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> everybody to the right, please. Preston over here. Down right. here. Lower row. This way, please. Just up. 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 Just yeah, yeah. Again, please take a step forward. Just come a step forward. To the right. That's the right, please. And down in the center, please. Down in the center. Down in the center. That's the right, please. And just one here, please. Come, come, come to the right. Which step is right? Right, right. Any step is right. Rolling for us. Guys, lower center again. Lower center. And now we're going to do rows solo. So please say that rows. Yeah. And then we'll do And rows. 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 This way, Rose, 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 Children to the right face. Just show your head to the right. Just to the center, please. Just to the right Down here. Just one close, please. Don't take over here. Just to the center, please. 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 Just Love Lies Bleeding, Love Lies Bleeding yeah, is screening Berlinale here as a Berlinale special gala starring Kristen Stewart, who presided over the jury at last year's Berlinale. It's the second film by Rose Glass, who made a name for herself with Saint Maud, a horror film. Now she has made a lesbian thriller, which is also a road movie through the vastness of America, a story of love and revenge between a bodybuilder and a gym manager in New Mexico. Both sink deep into the criminal network of the small town. The film thrives off the landscape and the sensual performance of the two leading actresses, Katie O'Brien and Kristen Stewart.
Okay, thank you so much, gentlemen and ladies. Please take a seat. It is an immense pleasure to introduce here um, the press conference of um, the 74th Berlinale entry, Love Lies Bleeding. Here we have um, on my far right, director Rose Glass, who already made some waves with her previous film, St. Maud. And we have our former jury president back here. It's a great pleasure to see you again, Kristen Stewart. So I'm going to ask um, a first question and then we'll open up to the audience and we go first to the lady over there. Thank you. So um, you made a, an ecstatic steroid ridden roller coaster of a film that keeps peaking from one scene to the next until it ends with a peak. Um, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to know why you decided to set the film in America. It just seemed to be the place that made the most sense for the story as soon as we started getting all the guns and muscles kind of involved. <laughs> and I, I think also that period in, and place in America, particularly cinematically, it sort of developed an almost mythological kind of feel, that kind of all the Americana stuff. So the scale of it felt like an appropriate backdrop to this story. And was it also because you were playing with references that were set within American film history, perhaps? Sure, yeah, we ended up enjoying leaning into that when we were writing it, yeah. Okay, yeah. And also I want to mention uh, Veronica, the writer, um, you, you made the previous film with her also, you studied with her at the National Film and Television School. Um, I just want to mention her because she did an amazing job writing also and she needs a credit here. So, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, Veronica Tafilska is incredible, she's a writer-director as well and you know we've been friends for years and kind of always read each other's scripts and I wrote St. Maud by myself and um, found it a bit sort of stressful and isolating. So this time around, I thought it would be great to try mixing it up a bit and try co-writing. Thank you. First question. Okay, hi, I'm Sofia from Argentina. First of all, I wanted to congratulate you because the movie was amazing, the theater was having a blast, your performance was amazing, Kristen. And this question is for Rose. Like, how did you pitch the idea, taking into account the tonal shift since Zen Mod? Uh, like, you said the film on Luis on steroids or something, <laughs> literally. Um, yeah, that, that's how it. did I pitch it? Yes, how did you pitch it? Really badly, I think. To be <laughs> I never never know how to describe it. I think I think I sent you some awkward email, kind of being like, it's sort of a crime thriller romance satire fast thing, um, and waffled a lot. I don't think we were using any particular film references at that point. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this gentleman first, then the lady. Thank you. You first. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, Kristen, congratulations on the uh, movie. Uh, I'm going to be seeing you tonight also at the Verity Music Hall. You were here last year as a president, a great president of uh, the jury, uh, the Berlinale 2023. But I want uh, just, um, I want to express. Uh, my gratitude for the wonderful performance also of Ed Harris, virtually, and Dave Franco. And, I mean, <laughs> you, you're uh, really a, a wonderful actress, and I thank you for this film. And my question is really short. Uh, what do you think is the... Uh, why do you think Berlinale is one of the most uh, important film festivals? And why do you... Uh, what attracts you the most uh, here? in this city, in this film center, and uh, why do you think this, this movie needs to have this world premiere here? Thank you very much. It's not short. <laughs> <laughs> Liar. <laughs> um, uh, well, I think there's like, you know, there's an inherent sort of radical leaning sort of uh, willingness to examine films that, that might not have very much commercial success or, you know, th there, there are films that make 
statements and ruffle feathers, and I, I, every time I've ever been here, I've always felt like um, there's something a little bit like irreverent and cool about it. I don't know, like a, a, the, for, for lack of a, a, a more sort of astute way of putting it, uh, um, it, it's cool here. <laughs> How would you describe that? I'd like it's a, cool. yeah, like this this movie. You could find sort of the references, but the amalgamation of, of her interests and the kind of like, the sort of um, like dressing down of America that she's done is funny and also I think has, it's like a nice, it's nice to put it in a European context. Um, and yeah, it's just sort of like the, the addiction to affirmation, the, the, the idea that if you believe it, then it can be that's not always the truth, is it? Um, even though it's a nice, it's a nice notion, and so it's nice to put a movie like that. That's kind of a, a, a you know, from a European perspective, very much made in America by mostly Americans, except for Rose. Uh, it's nice to bring it here and 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 feel feel the the friction of of what she's trying to say and sort of underline that point. Hi. Anna Helmi for ZTF. My question to you first off, congratulations uh, on this kick-ass love story. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Blew me away. And then my questions, two questions, Kristen Stewart. Um, what initially sold you to the story? Was it the script? Was it Rose Glass? Was it Ed Harris? Was it A24? Which was it? <laughs> and my question to Rose Glass is, um, you managed to have this wonderful chemistry of these two actresses on, um, on screen. Um, how early on did you have Kristen Stewart in mind for your movie? And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Katie O'Brien had to audition six times. Is this true? And when did you decide this is the pair? Thank you. Um, I, I definitely did this, did this movie for Rose. The initial draw was that I, St. Maud is one of my favorite movies and um, yeah, when we met, she was just this, like, I, we were kind of friends immediately, and, and when, she, when she pitched it, and I hate to sort of beat a dead horse on this one, but she was like, you know, I was trying to think of my follow-up film, trying to think of a new movie to make, because St. Maud was so great, A24 is willing to, to <laughs> provide a lot of money to make her second movie, which is so fucking cool. <laughs> and uh, she was like, just saying how the kind of common conversation about women making films is that we get to empower ourselves and each other and uh, in a kind of um, endearingly petulant way. And she was like, I'll make a movie about a strong girl. <laughs> and uh, I got to play the weak one. Uh, I got to play somebody who is kind of stuck and paralyzed and, and would never be the person at the center of a film. And I didn't know that, by the way, before. I mean, I read the script before saying yes to the, to the part, but I truly was in kind of, um, after hearing her flimsy pitch, which wasn't <laughs> flimsy at all. It, it, it was exciting. And I remember actually mainly you were just talking about a big crack in the ground. I can't remember it. I just remember thinking I was making no sense and that it went terribly. <laughs> so I was really happy with it. Yeah, it's um, a nice message. It's like, phew. But yeah, no, I, I honestly, I don't know why. I, I, the, the script is, the script was interesting to read because like there were, you, you could interpret it so many different ways. There, it, it's, it wasn't funny to me. But then when we were making the movie, I realized just how ballistic she wanted to lean and kind of, Understanding like, oh, you know, sometimes when you play a part, you have to really rationalize every decision and, and, and fully get behind um, loving them and kind of uh, justifying every, every move they make. And uh, so then when I watched the movie, I was like, oh, this is like absurd and she's a terrible person, <laughs> like as we all could be and have the sort of capacity to be. Um, it's a secret comedy. Yeah, it's like a secret comedy, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, whatever, I just thought that Rose, Rose is somebody who should be making movies and should be telling people what to do, and I wanted to be one of them. Um, and in terms of the chemistry between the two characters, I mean, it's a hard thing to quantify. Like, we didn't really have much rehearsal time at all with these guys. Like, Kristen was on board really early on, and then Katie, yeah, we cast her really close to the wire not too long before the shoot. I don't remember her auditioning that many times, but we did, we did see her a couple of times. Um, <laughs> 
And the chemistry thing, I guess it's, it's sort of complicated and simple at the same time. Obviously, there's lots of different decisions that go into, you know, you sort of, you know, you hope you cast the right people. And then obviously these guys give these incredible performances, but it's, it's all in also how you're dressing them and shooting it and the music, you know, everything's trying to make these two fictional people feel um, something real. Um, but even if you do all that, I guess, you still have to hope that there's just gonna be this chemistry between them um, and you just have to sort of hope and pray that that happens and I think it did <laughs> so that was a big relief um, Hi this is Lisa Forster from the German press agency DPA and I have a question for Kristen Stewart um, a few days ago um, um, a rather intimate story about you appeared in Rolling Stone magazine that kind of went viral. I couldn't wait to come do this press conference for all the follow-up questions. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this, I so woke this up this morning so excited about it. <laughs> yeah. I even saw a podcast based on the iconic copper. So that was kind of mad. And I was wondering how you personally feel about this huge public interest in you and your story. Um, I mean, I... There are sort of moments in time that you would like to encapsulate and sort of, uh, yeah, make a little like, yeah, make a little, a little collaborative art project about a moment in your life. And that's kind of all that was. That's what the magazine gives people opportunities to do. And um, yeah, it was like, uh, I love how the story, I love how this, the writer of the story who was great and shaped it really well and I had a really nice time with her. Um, called the story uncensored and then the whole cover was censored <laughs> because the existence of a female body thrusting any type of sexuality at you that's not designed for or desired by exclusively um, cis straight males is like something that people are like um, not like super comfy with and and so I'm really happy with it I had a good time and I will I thank Rose for the kind of um, combination of references I don't know we did this movie and it was like the person who we normally don't listen to, the person that we normally don't look at, like, she's up front and center in her movie. And, uh, yeah, just toying with the idea of strength because the interviews that we, we do as artists, as female artists, are, are so prescriptively pushing this idea of uh, empowerment because it makes everyone else more comfortable about the fact that we've been so oppressed. <laughs> and so it's like, it's, okay, it's definitely okay to take things, different pictures, mix them up in a way that people aren't used to and go, you know, that's okay too. In fact, it's pervasive and it's everywhere and it's being denied and it's crazy that it's not more, that it's crazy that there aren't more pictures like that. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, so I, I, I loved the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Nadine from the Berlin newspaper Tagesspiegel and I have a question to the both of you for, about the queer representation. Since we don't have that many um, female-led queer movies in the mainstream, um, I wanted to ask you, how did you deal with the responsibility that comes along with fill, trying to fill this gap a little bit? And also the expectations maybe of the queer community, did, did you have that in, in, in the back of your head? And one. More question, um, what's the status of the Susan Sontag project? Maybe if you could okay. tell us a bit about that. Uh, the Sontag thing will be made over such a long span of time. Um, it's a kind of, uh, the format is, is unique. It's, it's kind of a hybrid documentary research project experiment, film within a film type thing. And um, we've, we started actually last year here at uh, the festival and I don't know when we're going to finish it. It's it's a it's a it's a sort of open-ended process. And in terms of your uh, first question, I or feeling of responsibility or to do with representation, I, to be honest, tried to I, I sort of didn't put any pressure on myself to overthink that sort of thing. I don't know the queer aspects of the film and the cat. It was just always trying to be led by what was the most interesting version of these characters, just what felt the most um, intriguing and real to me and Veronica when we were writing it. Um, and just go with the most interesting story and try not to think at all about any external expectations and um, 
reasons for doing something other than what's going to serve the story best. Hello. Uh, my question is to Christian. Uh, there was one very impressive moment in this film when uh, the sister of your character said that you don't know what is love. And a uh, mm. lot of people around us in the world are under violence, but uh, I have not... I have not answered. They can't change their life, or they can. They didn't want to change their life, uh, and I was thinking about this after this detail. Then your sister told that you don't know about love. Where, where is love in her life? Yeah, and um, you're shining everywhere. You're a very strong human being. You can be a role model. What, 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 did, what can you say for these people, for these women? What, what can we change mind or change something in their life? Thank you. I, d I missed which bit you sort of were talking about. I'm yeah, so sorry. like the actual. Qu um, you mean? Uh, I mean, people, women under violence, uh, they can change their life, or they don't want to change because right, the right, right. character of women are enduring. Yeah, says that you don't know what is love. She's in hospital, but she's thinking about love. Sure, 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 sure. That's yeah. why I'm asking about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, thank you for... for yeah, yeah, thank you. I get it. Um, uh, love is such a, a, a... Well, it sort of implies that there's a, a fixed definition. Or we all say it so affirmatively, like, well, it's okay because I love them. Well, it's, well I was in love with him, so I... It's like, yeah, but what a... That's... You might have a feeling of love for someone even if it's an, an entirely reciprocated feeling, it, it's defined by that individual in an entirely different way that you could never truly understand from, from their perspective. It's, we're having one-sided conversations with ourselves, like the projections that we have of our loved ones. Um, we, we love those projections, but like how well we, how close or how well we can really like know a person is, that's an ephemeral thing. That's why we're always reaching and striving to just like express and communicate and get closer and say, I love you. Um, it means it means something different to everyone. So I think that that moment is particularly devastating because I think Lou is con it's really telling herself a story and has been telling herself a certain mythology, a certain and I don't want to say fictional to imply that it's a lie, but a, a certain made up story that sort of gets her through her day to day, which is I love my sister, but they don't really know each other anymore. And so what does that mean? And yeah, I love that scene because it's like, um, we just are all kind of living our own experiences and, and, and that leads to a lot of presumption. And um, yeah, like, but then I guess to answer your question, I also think that in a very general sense, of course, like, love is great. <laughs> it helps. Helps people. <laughs> How yeah. would you help me out? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's a difficult question because obviously mm. it's a very light, uh, you know, quite comedic film, um, which obviously sort of delves into some quite dark subject matter. But I, you know, I don't have any big answer or solution to a very difficult question like that. Um, in that particular scene, obviously, like Kristen said, uh, you know, love in and of itself isn't going to fix anything for anyone. It's not necessary. It's not a necessarily moral thing that's going to bring out the best best in people or lead them to the best situations. Um, so I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you, I'm afraid. In our movie, it kind of leads to um, bad stuff, <laughs> typically. <laughs> Even if sometimes it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Mahari Sagit, African Refugee News. First, I want to say that to see your film yesterday night, uh, we had to go to two, three kinos because it was all full up. So I saw the film around 11 o'clock at night. I loved the, the way you, you started the film. It was really fantastic with this girl walking. And uh, you talk about love, but this is real love. Because in the world there is no more love. <laughs> there is so much hate, and so when you see this film, you really feel uh, good. But I wanted to ask you, Kirsten, uh, I saw you in Twilight because of my daughter, and then I saw you in other films. Yeah, but children are for this. And uh, then I, I discovered you as really one of the best that was Into the Wind, the last 
10 seconds when you're saying goodbye to the guy, your face, your emotion. Can you tell us more about you? Because <laughs> huh. thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, What's the question? What, what is the question? <laughs> But thank you for saying all that. It's no, really the question sweet. Was, no, 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 no. You're right because uh, I was a bit long, but I'm coming out from another film. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We are a bit. Uh, so no, I just wanted to know uh, the introduction of the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to know more about it. Also about the music because it was good music, and about you, if you can tell us more about you, not only what we read in the in the papers. I want to hear well, from you. What did I have for breakfast? What time did I get to sleep last night? <laughs> Um, I love the beginning of the movie as well. The, the, in, the intro to the movie is incredible. Um, it's like, it's the crack. And then just the walk. <laughs> it really feels like she's going somewhere and you're like, oh boy, I don't know if I should be following this girl into this gym. It just has this, this very propelling energy that you're like, maybe I shouldn't walk the plank <laughs> off the ship into the ocean. What, to follow Jackie into the ocean? Yeah. I thought that bit when you see her across the gym for the first time was more like being influenced by the bit in The Mask where Jim Carrey sees Cameron Diaz across the <laughs> yeah. bank. Oh, so woo, exactly just <laughs> slow motion. Um, well, thank the you for your kind words. Yes. And yeah, thank the you. beginning of the movie is sick. Sets a tone. <laughs> yes. Um, no. Oh, yes. You and then the lady in front of you. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for making and presenting this movie here. It really managed to cho- showcase aspects of queer femininity I have never seen like that on the screen before. And I have a question about that, especially regarding the bodybuilding, which is like a very interesting motive in the film, I feel, since it's normally something which is uh, very, very masculine uh, in, in movies and in like modern modern discourse about bodies. So I'm curious about um, how you de- developed this motive, if it was there from the beginning, or if you um, first wrote the characters and then found bodybuilding as like a way to tell the story afterwards. No, it was very much bodybuilding and the idea of wanting to write a character who was a bodybuilder. That was kind of the sort of initial seed that then the other characters in the story came from. And yeah, as um, I mean, as probably as someone who's very obviously not a bodybuilder themselves, I think I just sort of found it fascinating and strange as as a because it's sort of a performance art as much as it is a sport. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's something kind of strangely anarchic and beautiful, but sort of strange about it. Um, and I guess I was just interested in wondering about what kind of um, psychological sort of traits it would take to to get yourself sort of looking like that because you're sort of transforming yourself into like a human statue in a way. I don't know. I just thought that would be psychologically um, interesting territory to explore. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Mel from Museum Cinematic. Um, to me, this was a story about um, empowerment and identity as well. And I think these characters are so refreshing to see and so complex as well. And um, Kristen, I was wondering if you drew any inspiration from somewhere to um, approach this character and to Rose. Um, what do you hope the audiences take away from the story? <laughs> I hope people take away from the story um, that it's very difficult to quit smoking and you shouldn't start in the first place. (laughs) That's a good one. My jumping off point was just the script. I know that's such a boring answer. Um, I didn't... I'm trying to remember the films that we were talking about. I don't want to blow your... I'm not going to say because that's not my answer. (laughs) Rose is like... I can't remember now. Um, I remember we hadn't seen Showgirls, but then I think you didn't watch it until like we were sort of halfway through the shoot. You came out of your trailer and you're like, oh, and now I get it. Ah, yeah. okay. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I tend to be kind of literal. Like I take everything a little bit too literally and earnestly. And so I sort of, I watched that movie and went, I see. Like, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but um, it's, a, it's a real thrust. Uh, yeah, um, no, I, I, I really loved the script and, and Lou, and uh, I don't know, I loved how she fit into this family that you actually, you get a sense of 
it in a sort of ephemeral way. We're not always in an expository way telling you exactly what happened and why she hates her dad and what her daddy issues are about. Um, you just know she's got him. Yeah, you just know she's got him. She just doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know how else to... I, I, just really loved, I just really loved her. There was something sort of dear and sweet about somebody who has like internalized like so much misogyny but then just does, but doesn't want to be a bad guy. <laughs> just wants to be a good guy, man. Um, but has a, kind of a hard time doing that. And so therefore uh, sort of ceases to exist until something comes along to kind of wake her back up. And yeah, the script was great. I loved it. I also love all the motivational uh, quotes in the gym. They're really Oh yeah, it was cool. fun Googling. <laughs> just went on lots of different bodybuilding kind of like Instagram pages and oh, it's wow. just lots of, lots of good stuff, yeah. <laughs> Nice. They're so embarrassing, <laughs> especially being, I mean, you know, I, I don't take credit for everything America has ever, ever done, but it is, it is so distinctly an, an American perspective is that like extreme affirmation thing. Be and then to watch her like laugh at the signs, I was like, oh boy, yeah, that's true. <laughs> hey, if it works. <laughs> Question in the back, gentleman in the back. Oh, you don't have a microphone yet? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you go oh, over there, sorry. Hi. Um, I think uh, uh, you've made a really important uh, queer movie, uh, so congratulations. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Um, can you maybe tell us about your three favorite queer movies other than this one? Oh, toughy. <laughs> I mean, like Bound, I guess, is a pretty, obviously, a pretty landmarky oh, one, particularly so in relation to that. this I film. To watch that, I, I oh, literally, so that's like on my list. I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, that's so funny that you say. For me, that. it's then anything directed by John Waters. I think Female Trouble is my favourite one of his films, um, and I kind of think, like, in some ways, I'm like Jackie's the sort of like Dawn Davenport, but it's quite different. Um, so that's more than three of it's all of his films. I don't know. Which mm. Do I have any? Oh God, what is it? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, God, at like the Chloe moment. I mean, just at the moment, maybe you know, because you don't have to make it of all your life. So maybe that makes it easier. Right. You don't want me to just sit here for a longer. No, <laughs> no I do. Are you sure? <laughs> um, uh, I feel like when I was younger, like there are certain. I feel like they're well. They're sort of shrouded in. And like, there are queer movies that are hiding, kind of. Like, this is not gonna seem obvious at all, but this movie now and then where Christina Ricci is like taping her tits before going out and playing with her friends. I was like, that's a, that's a queer oh, movie. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that one. And then um, like Chloe Sevigny and If These Walls Could Talk too. that really did something to me. And um, what else? One more. Well, it's okay. I feel like that's good. Wait, are there other? Come on, there are so. This is this is I know, what I know. happens. Well, like, then you just get like brain freeze, and it's like I've forgotten every film I've ever. Gay stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Happy stuff, together. Gay stuff, gay stuff. Boys don't cry. No. Boys don't, Boys don't cry. cry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I will say that that was like for me. Well, I'm not gonna comment. The movie's stunning. Yeah, but it wasn't. I was so. Young. I yeah. haven't rewatched it. You were too young. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was really little. Not to say that that doesn't seep in somehow, but um, what about you? I'm actually curious. So, like, what's off the top of your head? <laughs> Mulholland Drive. Yeah. For oh sure. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> True. Be up there as well. <laughs> yep. Good job. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Question in the back. Yes. Ronnie Torauer, German Press Agency Radio Service. A question to Kristen Stewart. Uh, uh, could you explain a little bit the different feeling uh, to be here just presenting a movie after being the jury president uh, last year? And do you have plans to come back every year now? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was such an incredible experience. It's so surreal and absurd actually to be the president of a jury that's so stocked like just you know ground up full of acclaimed and incredible filmmakers that I was able to learn from um, it's it's a uh, it, I love I love representing Rose I love coming here and talking about a movie it is hard. I, Lupita's gonna probably do a better job than me. She's so good at forward facing and sort of like being a spokesperson. I love this festival. I love being here, but it was 
scary. <laughs> I was so intimidated. I wanted to represent, you know, and, and uh, yeah, honor it in the way that, that would come across to journalists, you know, and that doesn't always happen. <laughs> if you don't find the right words, hopefully I find them now. I was so uh, flabbergasted to be asked to come be the president of the jury here. Um, it was, it's, it's still funny for me to think that it happened, uh, but it was, it was uh, yeah, it was, one of the, it, was, it was like a little consolidated uh, film school. I would come back here every year. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mareike here for the Bit Set, and I was wondering, you said earlier that um, you find Berlinale as a festival really cool, and if you could maybe elaborate on that a little. Oh yeah, because that's what I was trying to do earlier. <laughs> and what brought Thanks. you back to Berlin, and then a question for the both of you. Um, what are you up to now, and what's next? Excuse me. I'm here doing this, yeah, going to film coming out, so doing that at the moment, basically. <laughs> Why is Berlinale cool? Yeah, why is it cool? Well, I don't know. It doesn't know. even need saying, it's just obvious. You know? <laughs> it's kind of inherent. Um, well, what are we doing? We're releasing this movie and talking to you about it, and uh, she's probably cooking up something that she's just not going to tell you yet, or me probably, when we walk off. She's like, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, we're just trying to like get stuff going, you know? Like, we're just loading the gun, as it were. Yeah. Sorry, we, it's like when you don't have things actually going, you can't talk about them yet. I know, exactly. <laughs> it's just like stuff, things. <laughs> things yeah. and stuff, cool things. things. And stuff. Sorry, we're really okay. good at this. We have one last question. Hi. Um, so I also was going to reference the Rolling Stone interview uh, where you mentioned that this movie is really unique as a queer story because it doesn't focus on a coming out story or something like that, but really it's the whole like background vibe of the mm -hmm. movie. Um, and so I was wondering if, having had the experience of working on this movie and playing this character, it's kind of set like a new standard for you in terms of how queer stories are told and how um, queerness is kind of centered in film. Um, I, d I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's changed. Yeah, I'm like, nah. <laughs> the most self-effacing person of all time, like even more than me. Uh, um, I think I think we can't keep doing that um, thing where we tell everyone how to feel and where we sort of pat each other on the back and receive brownie points for for providing space for marginalized voices and 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 only in the capacity that they are allowed to speak about that alone. Um, yeah, I think like adjacent perspectives of well-worn stories. We've all been here the whole time, you know, throughout, like, I think, I think, I think the era of, of them being, of queer films being so pointedly only that is done, it's over. Like, I mean, maybe they'll keep happening, but I, I, I think it's like, um, things develop and move on, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's uh, just sort of inherent to, like, how, how we're all moving forward. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I was happy to do Happiest Season because it was, like, it was, it was a gay old time. It was a Christmas movie. It was a completely commercial, straightforward, right down the line, like, you know, like, uh, hide the vegetables type of popcorn thing that we're never really allowed to have. But I did that once, and now I'm really kind of into the idea of unearthing sidelined perspectives and not making it all about the reasons that they're sidelined, but their actual experience, you know what I mean? Like people who, what they love, what their desires are, like, you know, where they come from, where they want to go, and then, um, yeah, and, and not, not feeling like you always have to stand on a fucking soapbox and, like, be everyone's spokesperson. Thank you all so much, um, thank and you. Um, I wish you a beautiful premiere tonight, and thank you very um, much. thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you guys.